catch Fittipaldi, but the Indianapolis wall did. No problem for Mercedes-Benz. Unzer was in second and took the lead, the checkered flag, and Indy's million dollars. But for IndyCar sanctioned races, the Mercedes-Benz isn't legal. So the Penske team uses the Ilmore racing engine. It served them well. After punting his teammate, Paul Tracy took Detroit. Fittipaldi's Ilmore powered Penske won at the Phoenix Mile. And four times, the Ilmore pushed Unzer first across the finish line. Honda didn't make Indy, but is here making strides. A Honda gave Bobby Rahal a second two weeks ago. At Michigan, Ford powers the young contenders, like Jacques Villeneuve, second place at Indy, the leading rookie in the series. Robbie Gordon, Toronto's pole sitter. And Michael Andretti, twice the winner this year with more visions of victory. Ford Cosworth, Gilmore, and Honda, the power battle behind the men of the Michigan 500. Michigan International Speedway and its high banks as ESPN presents live our coverage of the Marlboro 500. What can in fact be the toughest day for the Indy cars. We're located about 70 miles west of Detroit in the beautiful Irish hills of southern Michigan. These high banks can be very, very challenging for these cars and create some enormous energies. And there's a gigantic crowd here on hand to watch the Indy cars as they are ready to go to the line in the Marlboro 500. Hi everybody, I'm Paul Page and this race and its high banks always hold some surprises. There's always an unusual result here and it expected to be no different here today. Now because of that and the fact that two weeks ago at Toronto, Al Unser Jr. scored no points at all, well the points championship, the whole national championship can be determined here. Now this is a pivotal race. Emerson Fittipaldi, Michael Andretti closing in as are the rest. So in fact at this race here today we can see a complete change in the complexion of the PPG points battle. So as we watch this race today you're going to see an awful lot of surprises and in that group of drivers challenging is the pole sitter here today, Nigel Mansell. He's with Gary. And Paul, he's also the defending champion of this race. He qualified at nearly 234 miles per hour. We know of the great demands on the driver, on the race car, at these speeds, on these banks. How tough is it physically to adapt to 500 miles, Nigel? I think on a track like this, incredibly so. I mean, um, about twice as much as probably Indianapolis because the, you know, the intensity of the lateral G you're pulling all the time on these banks the confidence factor for you and your team today going in? Uh, as long as the car, car holds together and it runs okay, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, but it's going to be a long way. Let's go to Jan Bikas in the middle of the front row. Well, Gary, Raul Boisel has his best starting position here at Michigan. And Raul, why is it that you always run so quickly on the big tracks? I have no idea. Maybe I think we have a good setup on the car. Uh, I enjoy very much. I have a lot of confidence to go fast and... Uh, uh, we proved today, so we have a good setup in Indy. Uh, we carry through here with some changes for the bumpy track, and uh, I feel comfortable and uh, I'm looking forward for the race. Now you've lost Mo Nunn, and he's next door to us working with Michael, but yet you qualified him. Yeah, Mo is very good. So uh, he put uh, Michael in front. He wasn't doing so well, and uh, we carry some of uh, uh, what we learn in Indy through here. And uh, Dick Simon has a good. Uh, uh, way to set up a car for the oval, so is 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 working well. Thank you, Raul. Let's go next door here to Gary Gerald. So, Michael Andretti, you come in on a roll now, completing this fast front row. You won on the streets in the last race at Toronto, and we talk about this being a pivotal race in terms of the points championship. You vaulted to third with the win at Toronto. Is this the key, perhaps, of this season today for your championship hopes? It's a big key, I think, you know, because it's such a long race and it's a race of survival, and uh, you know, not many of your fellow competitors are going to finish so if you're lucky enough to be one of them uh, you know you're going to gain a lot of points on them so uh, it's a very big race for us everybody agrees this is going to be some 500 miles paul and there are some terrific stories on the line here for the running of the marlboro 500 at michigan 250 hard hard fought laps we'll be right back Today's coverage on ESPN of the Indy Cars is brought to you by Toyota, makers of the exciting all-new Celica. Watch out, it's here. By Goodyear, number one in tires. And by your local Yamaha dealer who invites you to see their exciting line of motorcycles, ATVs, and snowmobiles. 
It's a beautiful day. It's warming up here, but the crowd has settled in for our coverage live of the Marlboro 500. Now, we've indicated, Derek Daly, what a tough track this is. It can punish both man and machine. This is officially the fastest racetrack in the world, and I'm not sure a punishment is even strong enough a word to be used for what can happen here at Michigan. When you think about racing above 230 miles an hour average for 500 miles, the forces exerted through the cars and drivers are phenomenal. Parts on the cars can fatigue and break here without any warning and winning drivers in the past like Michael Andretti and the defending champion Nigel Mansell have had to have been lifted from their cars such was the level of exhaustion so at speeds like that as you can imagine the slightest miscue can spell disaster and over the years we have seen many many Indy cars reduced to kit form against these very unforgiving Michigan walls Some of these accidents have been incredibly spectacular. Perhaps the most spectacular occurred a decade ago, and it involved Chip Ganassi and Al Unser Jr. When Chip Ganassi and I got together in 84 on the back stretch coming off the two, it was the first time I had, I had lost control of my car at 200. I think we were having a bad day uh, to start with. Uh, the car was obviously a little loose, and uh, basically we had a shock problem. We were bottoming the shock a lot. I really don't remember much. Then when we slid down in the infield and hit the fence, then it was then it was big. Uh, I remember going down the front straightaway, and uh, the next morning I woke up at the hospital. Never forgotten it. Because of situations like that, many of the crews here fear running at the Michigan 500. When we come back, it'll be time to start the engines. Back at the Marlboro 500 is Michigan as we move closer and closer to the start of the engines. But stories developing already here today, Gary Gerald. Indeed, Paul. We've talked about the speed and the pressure and the load factors on these cars. Here's graphic evidence from the warm-up session this morning. This is a wishbone mounting front suspension left side Mark Smith's car. Look at this. This is a stress or a fatigue failure and a total collapse of this particular part. It has kept screw, uh, crews scrambling here for the last two hours trying to make a fix. Now, let me grab this bar over here and I'll give you an idea. This is not the appropriate size, but they're taking bars such as this and they're putting them on top and on bottom. Now this is down inside the cockpit on the lower left and right front sides. But this is what the speeds of 230 miles per hour and the load factor on the car can do. It's a frightening situation. These cars have done a remarkable job, or the crews have done a remarkable job in making this repair within the last two hours. They've inventoried all of these cars. Everybody says they're now ready for the command to get ready to go racing. So Paul, this is, this is tough, and this is what Michigan and 500 miles is all about, obviously. Well, Derek, you've raced here, you've crashed here. What can the attitude of a driver be that has to climb in a car with that repair done in the last minutes? The older you are, the more you aware you are of the possibilities and the consequences. To give you an example, Eddie Cheever only spun coming off turn two last year, and it still scares him going through turn two. So this could be a problem. All right, the crowd waits, and so do we, as we're ready for that most famous command in sports. And indeed... ...event marketing, Philip Morris, USA. For the Marlboro 500, gentlemen, start your engines! Villeneuve, he's set and ready to go as the engines fire up and down the line. All of the IndyCar is ready. Nigel Mansell is set and ready to go. 
So the horsepower now begins to scream out its challenge from these power plants as we are ready to go racing. 250 laps lie ahead, 500 miles. The view from the rear wing of Michael Andretti. There's Raul Boisel sitting in the center of the front row. All of the cars now have started. No indication of any particular problem. You look at Robbie Gordon's car. What a great view that'll bring us here today. And Michael Andretti sits on the outside of the front row, and he begins to roll away with some special supports on the rear wings. Let's go pit side again and Jan Vikas. Well, Gary talked about what broke on the Lolo. Let's talk about what happened to the Raynard chassis. At the rear, they have a mounting block. This was on Jimmy Vassar's car. It's aluminum. It broke right across here. By the time his owner, Jim Hayhoe, could run down and warn all the other Raynard cars, Michael Andretti's broke as well. Thankfully, he was not at speed. These have been replaced by steel ones now that were produced by Jack Roush Racing in one evening. They worked all night after getting fax documents. All the Raynards now have this piece. Remember, the Raynard is an untested car here at Michigan. Let's check in now again with Gary. Another concern here, the Penske team is the only team that tests regularly here at Michigan, and we've talked about the punishment on the cars. Their testing has told them that they've come up with a unique change in their rear suspension. Normally, the rear springs, identical, mounted side-by-side side in tandem. What they've done because of the load factor on the right rear is use a spring that's actually one inch longer than the one on the left. So the right side spring is totally different on the Penske cars for this race. They're trying to ensure the fact that they can go 300 miles. They don't want that spring to be fully compressed because that magnifies the load factor on the right rear. If they can avoid that, they think they've got a better opportunity to go the 500 miles. It's a safety factor from Team Penske. The view from the front of Bobby Rahal's car as the parade laps are underway. And when we come back, we'll be ready to start the Marlboro 500 at Michigan. As the parade laps continue here at Michigan, let's take a look at the starting grid. On the pole, we'll look at the entire front row, as a matter of fact. On the pole is Nigel Mansell, his third pole of the year. Alongside Raul Boisel, who starts in the middle of the front row in both 500-mile races this year. Outside is Michael Andretti, only the second front row start this year for the two-time Michigan champion. In row two, it's Robbie Gordon, the Toronto Bull sitter. Mario Andretti, the 84 Michigan 500 winner. And Stefan Johansson in the fastest Penske chassis in today's field. Row three is Emerson Fittipaldi. His first win ever came here in 85. Teo Fabi, the 83 pole sitter. And Dominic Dobson, the fastest rookie qualifier in this field. In row four, Jacques Villeneuve. Paul Tracy is in the middle, and to the outside is Scott Goodyear. In row five, Adrian Fernandez. Al Unser Jr. with a surprising qualification run, and Marco Greco. Row six, Mauricio Guzelman, Jimmy Vassar, and Scott Sharp. In row number seven, Eddie Cheever replacing Brian Herta in A.J. Foyt's car. Hiro Mashushta and Buddy Lazier. The eighth row, Mike Groff, Willie T. Ribs and Bobby Rahal. The ninth row, Mark Smith, Ari Leyendijk and Ross Bentley. And alone in the tenth and final row is Jeff Wood. So now with a single PPG car in front of them, Jim Swintall trying to get all the field to close up on the pace car. We're set to go on the pace lap now. The field aligned in rows of three for the first time since 1989. 250 laps, 500 miles. The fastest race ever run here by Ellinger Jr. at 189.7 miles an hour. One car having a problem early on, ducked in and out of the pits. Did you see why he went in, Derek? I didn't. Buddy Lazier in the financial world car. Quick stop, but everything looks to be in order. But he was at the back of the grid anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. How nice they look in order. The former winners here in this race. Michael 